Thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I want to pay tribute to Sir Tony for organizing this conference and bringing together such a distinguished group of speakers and participants. It's a testament to your extraordinary convening power and the global respect that you command. Uh, it was striking to me and to many others during the pandemic, many of the most interesting policies, interventions were coming from you and the institute that you lead. Indeed, more than a decade after leaving office, you continue to have more to say of substance about the present and the future of this country. One of the things that characterized your time in the office was your focus on the future. That's why I was particularly pleased to be asked to talk about how technology is reshaping healthcare now and in the future. Over the past two years, our lives have been reshaped by COVID-19 pandemic. Millions have died and the aftershock continues. And yet, it's sobering to think how much worse it could have been. As this chart shows, if COVID-19 had this case fatality of MERS and the infectivity of measles, then there would have been hundreds of millions global deaths within the first six months. The pandemic has also, also saw the incredible breakthrough of mRNA vaccines. While mRNA therapeutics were discovered in the 1980s, it lay dormant until flagship pioneering and others began to explore its potential as a project that later became the company Moderna. After a decade of experimentation, refinement, and private investment of $5 billion, Moderna was able to design its COVID-19 vaccine minutes after receiving the genetic sequence. Not years, not months, but minutes. Yet we still face the challenge of new variants and the risk that they will escape current vaccines. We are not out of the woods yet, while evolution suggests that viruses will mutate and become less deadly and more infectious over time, that journey is not linear. There is still a real risk of new variants that escape vaccines, which are more infectious and also more deadly. The variant problem would once have been impossible to address. If every man, woman, and child alive were able to be a lab scientist, and each one of them were doing one million experiments every single hour, then it would take as long as the universe has existed to test every possible mutation of COVID-19 virus. Experimentation is the central to scientific method. At its core, a process of trial and error. What has limited biological sciences has been the seemingly limitless complexity of nature itself. That has been a universal truth. Until now. Deep learning and other artificial intelligence techniques are creating a whole new era in biological sciences. When combined with throughput, high throughput screening, we are able to organize nature's information to extent unimaginable even 10 years ago. Just think of the work of Demis Hazardous and DeepMind have done in unfolding the protein, the alpha fold. The potential impact on human health is enormous. For COVID, the breakthrough of mRNA vaccines is set to be followed by a new breakthrough, the creation of the first variant-proof vaccines based on variants we don't even have in nature at the moment. This is the approach that has been taken by a company called Aperori Bio, created again by flagship, which is the Boston biotech innovation firm. They are using deep mutational scanning to collapse the variant space, assess the impact of current vaccines, and to design a new antibody, antibody repertoire that can cover current and future variants. That will be the basis for the vaccines of the future. Just imagine a flu vaccine that could protect us against this year and next year's flu. Machine learning is also set to revolutionize cancer. The development of liquid biopsy where cell-free DNA shed from tumors is identified means 
we may soon routinely diagnose cancer at a stage zero. And these technologies will help us to predict chemo resistance and to select the best possible therapeutics for cancer patients. Meanwhile, machine learning is revolutionizing drug discovery too. Today, the first step of drug discovery is not in vitro, it is in silico. Recursion Pharma, for example, has fully automated dry labs and wet labs that runs 2.6 million experiments each week. Each of these examples uses machine learning to understand the complexity of nature in ways that have never been possible before. But what if nature was not the limit? What if we can go beyond it? Generate Bio is using advanced AI techniques to learn the code of nature itself. Rather than discovering existing proteins and what they do, Generate designs new proteins with a specific function. It opens up the possibility of fully programmable medicines that are designed rather than discovered. And it's not just proteins. Generate is able to design antibodies, peptides, and enzymes that have never existed in nature before. Rather than being limited by nature and the opportunities to transform human health are near limitless. So I say, welcome to the biological century. Now, as a surgeon who continues to practice in the NHS, I've been fortunate of using technology to reimagine surgery. What you can see here is the image of a beating heart that has been stabilized by tracking both the movement of the heart and the surgeon's eyes. It means that heart surgery is less dramatic for patients. It can be done without the need of risky heart and lung bypass machines. Advances in robotics have seen next generation probes that are far more dexterous than any surgeon's hands. They enable new frontiers in minimally invasive surgery, allowing a fundamentally different way to characterize and treat disease. Here you can see the da Vinci robot that has been used for many operations at the moment in the NHS, including prostate cancer and kidney cancer. These kinds of advances will lead to nanoparticles and micro-robotics circulating in the bloodstream and repairing tissue. But unless we transform our healthcare systems, the uptake of these innovations will be slow. Patients will miss out People will live in sickness when they could live in health. So reform of our healthcare system is a moral imperative. That's why I was delighted to read the report published today by the Tony Blair Institute on rebooting NHS reform. The problems are deep. The basic structure of health system hasn't changed in nearly 900 years. This is a picture of St. Bart's Hospital in London. Now, the founders of St. Bart's in 1123 would not have recognized modern medicine as we know it today. But they would have found the patterns of service delivery today reasonably familiar. We wait until we feel sick, until we have symptoms. That's what we do. We then go to see a doctor, usually a GP, working in their offices. And if we are seriously unwell, we go to a hospital. It's pretty much the same pattern as it was in 1123. NHS reforms have always focused too much on changing management or structures rather than changing the care delivery. But the current path is reaching the limits of sustainability. This chart is based on the US data. It shows that the world's largest economy is set to dedicate a third of its GDP to healthcare by 2050. For the UK, we could expect spending around 20% of our GDP of, on health nearly double what we are spending today. The problem is that most health systems struggle to kick their bad habits. These are the seven bad habits of health systems we developed with the World Economic Forum many, many years ago. And they remain the same. Healthcare systems focus on sickness, not on health. 
They focus on quantity rather than quality. No matter what the evidence, the status quo tends to prevail. Innovation is stifled. The focus is on inputs, not outcomes. Vast quantities of data rarely translate into insight or action. And there is a persistent failure to take responsibility or accountability. Imagination is essential to innovation. That's what we do in our labs every day. The first step to creating a new future is to imagine it. To ask the question, what if? So what if we invested as much in keeping people healthy as treating them when they are sick? We currently think about our health in just two states, that people are either in healthy or they are sick. In fact, there is a period of time between being healthy and becoming symptomatically sick. When physiological changes are underway in our bodies, that put us on a trajectory towards disease, but we do not yet have symptoms. We call this period pre-disease. If we can discover new biomarkers for these pre-disease states, then we'll enable us to intervene, to stop, slow, or even reverse them back to normality. So people never experience sickness. We've done that historically over the last century in many, many disease platforms. If we can preempt disease, then we can stop people from becoming patients in the first place. I believe the biological century can herald a whole new era of preemptive medicine, where we can consign disease to history, where healthcare adds life to our years as well as years to our lives, where we think about our health span as much as we think about our lifespan. What if implantable and wearable sensors could detect pre-disease? Imagine a world where our health is continuously and passively monitored. That rather than waiting for the symptoms of sickness, we would find out we were heading towards disease at a time where something could be done about it. And now imagine that rather than having to go to the GP surgery or hospital, most interventions could be delivered safely to us at home or in our community. A world of digital therapeutics, and digital therapeutics is here already. And treatments that could be delivered directly to us wherever we are, where we could monitor our present and future health through an app on our phones. That's the future of healthcare delivery. Technology means we can reimagine healthcare. It means more of our lives spent in health rather than in sickness. More time to live, to work, to study, to spend with our loved ones. Time itself is the promise of the future of healthcare. Welcome to a world liberated from disease, and thank you.